Hello everybody, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. Take your King James Bible and open it to the book of Zechariah. This is going to be chapter 11, commentary. And uh, this is going to be a fairly interesting study, my opinion. I've covered this in another, I think I got a playlist on trees, where I go a little more in depth on this, but uh, hey, sometimes it's good to hear something a couple times to uh, get it right, I guess. So, all right, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 1. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Now, remember, a Lebanon is a area west of Israel, and it talks about the fire that's going to devour the cedars. Now, the cedars of Lebanon, pretty much they don't even exist anymore, but supposedly they were very, very tall and good trees. Matter of fact, uh, Hiram, uh, King Hiram, I think it was King Hiram, helped Solomon with the cedar wood that they used for the temple, Solomon's temple. Cedar is a very interesting wood because it's uh, bugs don't like cedar. Termites and all those kind of they they don't they don't they won't mess with cedar. And from what I understand, cedar doesn't rot. It's a very good wood for building things. Very expensive. So, open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Howl, fir tree. Now, why would God be telling a fir tree to howl? For the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. Howl, O ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. All right, so are these actual trees, or is this a figure of speech? Hmm. Well, let's go take a look at Ezekiel chapter 31. And I guess we'll do verse 1. This is uh, something your denominational preachers will not touch with a 10-foot theological pole. No way. Ezekiel chapter 31 and verse 1. And uh, my opinion, Ezekiel is probably one of the, probably the wildest book in the Bible. That's some crazy stuff, people. Uh, especially in chapter 1, which the New Agers like to make you think that a spaceship came down and called itself God, you know. And, but I don't listen to New, to New Agers. Studied them a little bit. Been there, done that. Didn't get a t-shirt. What can I tell you? And it came to pass in the 11th year, in the 11th year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Now remember, Egypt was a great world power at one time. The Nile River supplied water to... Uh, their lands, and, you know, if you have water, you can grow crops, which would support a large population. Verse 3, listen carefully. Behold, the Assyrian. Now, who were the Assyrians? They were a people and an empire. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. Figure of speech here, people. 
The Assyrian was a cedar, a tree. That's what this is saying. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high nature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Uh, remember the old, that old Christmas song? Deck the hall with boughs of holly, fa la 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 la. Well, that's what they're talking about, boughs. I guess it's uh, groups of branches, right? So remember, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches. Figure of speech, right? The Assyrian is likened up unto a cedar tree. Verse 4. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Now remember, people, it was the Assyrians that conquered northern Israel before Babylon conquered Judah and Jerusalem. It was the Assyrian Empire. All right, uh, let's see. Verse 5. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field. Figure of speech. And his boughs were multiplied and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. Now remember, yeah, I think it was yesterday, we did a study, and in Revelation 17 and verse 5, when it talks about the whore and the beast and the whore that sat on many waters, well, in Revelation 17 and verse 15, it says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues tongues. Ah, so, so they're talking about the Assyrian being a cedar in Lebanon, and then in verse 5, therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he fought, shot forth. Just something to consider. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. Listen carefully at verse 8. The cedars, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. What was the garden of God? Well, we'll find out in a minute. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree, nor any tree, what kind of tree? Family tree? Nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden, ah, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Now, how do trees have emotions? You know, envy is an emotion. Do trees have envy, or is this a figure of speech? And the Assyrian 
was in the Garden of Eden. The trees of Eden, the garden that were in the Garden of God, envied him. So evidently, the Assyrian and other trees were in Eden, the Garden of God. You know, you've always heard, well, you know, Adam and Eve, they were, they were the first ones and there was nobody else in there. Well, is that true? Let's take a look at something. So, were there other family trees in the Garden of Eden? Uh, in Eden, the Garden of God? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look at something. In Genesis chapter 4, now remember, Cain had already killed Abel. If you want to read the whole chapter, go for it. Genesis chapter 4, verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. Uh, wait a minute. Where did Cain get his wife from? Was it one of these trees in the garden? Family trees? Possibly? Bible doesn't say. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he builded a city. Now, wait a minute. A guy gets married to a wife. We don't know where she comes from. She has a kid, and then you build a city? No. Yeah, no, no. You, you might build a house. You might build a house or a sh and a shed or two, but that's not a city. That's not a city, is it? I mean, you need a, a group of people and to build a city, right? And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch, and he builded a city, and called the name of that city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, there's two Enochs in the Bible. One's from the line of Cain. The other is from the line of Seth, who Adam and Eve had after Cain slew Abel. So, let's go back uh, let's see let's go back to Ezekiel 31 and verse 9 I have made him fair who the Assyrian the cedar of Lebanon I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden family trees that were in the garden of God envied him so evidently these trees are figures of speech because trees do not have envy as an emotion. Verse 10, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his height, I am shot up his top among the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in his height. Now come on, How, what, what kind of trees have a heart? I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. Ah, that was the Babylonians. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. How can trees be wicked? How can you drive trees out for wickedness? Figure of speech, people. You know, when Jesus is called the Lamb of God, it's a figure of speech. He didn't have four legs and a tail and go, bah. sorry. Of course, when he comes back as the king of kings as the lion of the tribe of Judah, there could be some roaring. Um, I don't know. We'll find out, won't we? Verse 14, And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him upon the mountains, in all the valleys, his branches are fallen and his boughs are broken by all the rivers of the land and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Huh. So, sometimes when uh, 
Let's see. Let's go... Well, may as well finish this up. Verse 13. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches. To the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, and all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death, to the nether parts of the earth. In the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit, the nether parts of the earth, the pit, that's hell, people. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day when he went down to the grave, now there's three words for hell, grave's one of them, and then uh, there's hellfire, and then there's uh, a Greek word called Tartarus which is where the fallen angels are, the ones that sinned. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, and like I mentioned before, the Jehovah's Witnesses love to take that first definition and say, see, see, hell, it means the grave. Well, you know, sometimes words have more than one meaning. Um... Why did the golfer wear, you know, the golfer, you know, you play golf for, whoosh, you know, that old Scottish uh, game, Jack, uh, I don't know, Tiger Woods plays it. I was going to say Jack Nicholas, but a lot of you young people wouldn't know that name. Um, why did the golfer wear two pairs of pants? Simple, in case he got a hole in one, right? Yeah, I know, terrible. But uh, sometimes words have more than one meaning. All right, verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof. And the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. Trees fainted? Really? I made the nations, the nations, to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit. And all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen to whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of eden yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of eden unto the nether parts of the earth thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and his multitudes, saith the Lord God. Huh, kind of interesting, huh? All right, let's take a look at something. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. All right, Genesis chapter 2. Let's go to skip to verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, really good question here. 
you got a tree of life and you got a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Are these actual trees or is this also a figure of speech? I kind of wonder if the tree of knowledge of good and evil was Satan himself. I kind of wonder. I'm not telling you to believe that because I'm not 100% sure either way. And the tree of life. Is that Christ or is that an actual tree? Well, let's go to Revelation 22. That's at the very, very end of your Bible. Revelation 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Huh. So, is this an actual tree? Kind of looks like it to me. Sometimes I am kind of a look at it and say, I wonder if that's actually a figure of speech for Christ himself. I don't know. All right, let's go read Zechariah 11. May as well start at verse 1. Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Ah, does that make sense now? Are we talking about a forest fire? Verse 2, howl. Fir tree, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. Howl, O ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. There is a voice of the howling of the shepherds, for their glory is spoiled. A voice of the roaring of young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. Now, I think these are false shepherds. Verse 4, Thus saith the Lord my God, Feed the flock of the slaughter. Feed the flock of the slaughter. Whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty. Oh yeah, they, they kill these people and then they say, I'm not, I'm innocent, I'm not guilty. And they that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their own shepherds pity them not. Boy, that sounds like uh, Billy Graham or uh, Joel Osteen. I'm rich, and you know what? Those kind of people, if they saw a homeless person, you think they'd buy him a sandwich, take five or ten bucks out of their pocket, on their way to the airport to get their $60 million Learjet and fly halfway across the country? Tch, don't count on it. For I am rich, and their own shepherds pity them not. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. But lo, I will deliver the man, every one, into his neighbor's hand, and into the hand of his king, and they shall smite the land, and out of their hand... I will not deliver them. Oh yeah, when judgment comes, look out. Don't look, don't be praying to the Lord to save you. Verse 7. And I will feed the flock of slaughter. Even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves. What's a stave? It's like a staff. The one I called beauty, and the other I called bands, and I fed the flock. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loatheth them. You know what it means to be loathed? It means you hate something. And their soul also abhorred me. 
So the Lord's soul hated them, and their soul hated him. Then said I, I will not feed you. That that dieth, let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I have made with all the people. Now think about it, people. Who did God make his covenant with? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. He made it with Abraham, confirmed it with Isaac, reconfirmed it with Jacob, Israel. That's the only people on this earth that God made a covenant with. Well, the 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 real the the good the good covenant. God did make a covenant with all the people of the earth that survived the flood that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood of water. The whole earth. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, if ye think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. In other words, if you think I'm good, give me, give me my money. And if not, don't. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Huh. Where have we read that before? 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price, that I was prized, of, uh, prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Ah, oh, another messianic covenant, or another messianic prophecy, people. Where have we read this 30 pieces of silver? Now, if you don't know it, 30 pieces of silver was the going price for a slave in the days of Rome. Where do we read about 30 pieces of silver? Can you say Judas? Matthew chapter 26 verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests, and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Ah, bingo. All right. Let's go to Matthew 27. All right, let's go to Matthew 27. So, Judas said, hey, 30 pieces of silver, I'll betray him, no problem. Matthew 27, 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests, not Catholics, and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Oh yeah, it sounds like the Romans, huh? And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then, Jesus, uh, then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to it. Ah, uh, boy. I guess, uh, I guess that's basically, they're saying, uh, well, that doesn't, doesn't matter to me. You know, big deal. So what? Verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went 
and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver piece and said, and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. So here it is, they had conspired to have Christ put to death innocently, committed murder, and they're worried about putting 30 pieces of silver back into the treasury because they might break some stupid rabbi's rule. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. All right, let's go back to Zechariah. Verse 12, 11 and verse 12. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price. And I was priced of, uh, at of them, and I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. See, I've been teaching that for a long time. Judah and Israel are not the same. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat, and tear their claws in pieces. Woe, woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock." The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Some Bible scholars say that this uh, reference to the right eye be utterly darkened has reference to the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast, of the book of Revelation wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me at all. All right, everybody, that's the end. Um, like, this is uh, in John 8, 12, we read, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father, and his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.